Bible open as we're going to look through these verses together over the next 20, 25, 30, 35, <laughs> 40 days. <laughs> Who's had an anniversary this week? Who's had a last week? Anyone had a birthday? Yes, right at the back. Wedding anniversary, anybody? You know, we celebrate certain days, don't we? The reason they started celebrating birthdays, I think, is that the mum would celebrate every year to thank God that she didn't die in childbirth. It's interesting, isn't it? I think the reason we celebrate teenagers' birthdays is because that's been another year without us actually strangling them. So <laughs> we celebrate big days. In the old days, they used to celebrate the anniversary of an operation as well. So if you, you know, were there on the kitchen table and the butcher came round with the knife and um, you didn't die, well, every year you would celebrate it. But, you know, sometimes there are days that we don't realize quite how significant they are. They are some of the most important days of our lives, and yet we didn't realize it at all. And that's what happened to Simon Peter here in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I've entitled this talk, A Day in the Life of a Disciple. And I hope, as we look at it, you will see it as a significant day for you today. As you walk with Jesus, the same way as Simon Peter walked with Jesus. Have you ever wondered why God made you just as you are? You say, oh, well, it's because I take after my parents. Well, yeah, that's true, <clears throat> but your brother or sister are very different from you, and they take after their parents. Why did God make you like you? Did he just have a wicked sense of humor that day? <laughs> God made you just as you are for a reason. Yeah, not just you as an individual, but you as a church. Why are you just as you are? Why has God brought you folks together? Paul tells the Ephesians, you are God's workmanship. You, plural, are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You are God's workmanship. God has designed you. You're his artistry. He's made you just as you are because he has a purpose. He has a plan. There is a reason why you are just as you are. And Simon Peter was going to discover that this day. Gladys Aylward discovered it in 1932 when she was 30 years old. If you see the film, The Inn of the Sixth Happiness, then that tells uh, a bit of her story. You can read the book, is it The Small Woman? Is that the book? And there are other books. But Gladys Aylward was a, um, well, she was a maid in a, a posh London house, and she was wonderfully converted. But she found it really difficult to forgive God for two things. Number one, she was about four foot eleven and a half. Why was she so short? Why couldn't she be five foot five like her friends? And she had plain, what she called dull, straight black hair. Why couldn't she be auburn or blonde or have nice curly hair like her friends? And being a young woman growing up in London, she really, really struggled with her appearance. Why was she so short with such drab black hair? But God laid on her heart to go to China. And so working as a maid, she saved every penny she could. And in 1932, she bought a one-way ticket on the train from London to China. And she went all the way around the world. It must have been an exhausting journey. And she finally landed in uh, China. She got off the train and she broke down in tears. Because as she looked around her, she saw that every woman was about four foot eleven with straight black hair. And the things that she was holding against God 
God in his infinite wisdom had done because he had a good purpose in it. God has made you just as you are for a reason. In 1969, Dr. Lawrence Peters wrote a famous book called The Peters Principle. And he says the Peters Principle is that everybody rises to their level of incompetence. So if you're good at your job, what happens to you? That's right, you get promoted. And if you're good at that, what happens to you? You get promoted. And if you're good at that, what happens to you? You get promoted. And if you're no good at that, what happens to you? You stay there. <laughs> he says, everybody rises to the level of their incompetence. And he said that explains the government and management to us. The Peter principle is that everybody rises to the level of their incompetence. But the Simon Peter principle that we're going to look at this evening, from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, the Simon Peter principle is with God, you rise to far beyond your level of incompetence. So we find the apostles saying, I'm not adequate for this, but God leads them to do it. Way beyond our natural competence. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, phenomenal life story, really exciting. And one of his daughters was called La Maréchale, the Marshal in French. She was involved in leading the Salvation Army in Paris. But when she was 13, she was out in the streets preaching the gospel. She would stand on a little box, she would sing, get a crowd, and preach the gospel to them at the age of 13. Incredible, isn't it? And one day she came home and her dad said to her, how did you get on? And she said, I did my best. And he turned on her. He said, your best is not good enough for God. And that's true. It's not our ability. We need to be channels through which God moves. And it's his work in us and through us. There needs to be this divine takeover so that it's not us, but it's Christ in us. And this is what Simon Peter discovers here. And we can see as we walk with Simon Peter uh, through four little stages. First of all, verse 1, we hear the word of God. Luke 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding round him and listening to the word of God, there was Simon Peter Verse 2, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. So there was Simon Peter. He had been fishing all night. He was now mending his nets because if you don't look after your nets, then when you go fishing tomorrow, you don't catch anything and you go hungry. So he was looking after his nets. And it just so happened... Jesus came to preach just there. Now, this wasn't the first time that Simon Peter had met Jesus. He and John had actually uh, heard John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God. And, and Peter had spent the day with Jesus. Another time, Peter had been with Jesus at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. But now, Peter was just the fisherman. And Jesus just happened to come and preach there. I mean, Jesus could have preached in the town. He didn't have to preach by the uh, side of the lake. And then it was a big lake. He could have preached anywhere, but he just happened to be preaching where Simon Peter was. And for Peter, it was great. He could listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ without having to even go to church. <laughs> it was so easy for him to hear the word of God. And that's the first thing that happened to him. He heard the word of God. For me, growing up, it was so easy for me to hear the word of God. I got taken to church whether I liked it or not. And I was made to listen whether I wanted to or not. I had no problems hearing the word of God. When I was a teenager and started bringing my friends along to church with me, I noticed that one of them brought his kit bag. I said, what have you brought your kit bag to church for? 
He said, oh, I've told my dad I'm going for rugby practice because he thinks if I go to church, he'll think I'm a nutter. And even then, it just wasn't cool to hear the word of God. But for me, it was easy. So easy. For us, it's so easy. Here we are this evening. Think of someone born on exactly the same day as you were born in North Korea. How hard it is for them to hear the voice of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Person born on the same day as you in Saudi Arabia. It's so easy for us and we mustn't lose the sense of privilege. I don't know if you know the joke about the um, aeroplane pilot who really didn't get on with the engineer. He would take his spitfire up and it would make odd noises and he would come down and blame the engineer. And the engineer would look at the engine and he would say, it's because you're not flying it properly. And he would blame the pilot. One day the engineer came into work and on the uh, cockpit was a notice that said, unfamiliar sound in the engine. Later that day when the pilot came in, there was a notice on the cockpit that said, listen to the engine for four hours. Unfamiliar sound is now familiar. <laughs> and you know, for some of us, we've heard the gospel so much, we forget what a privilege. What a privilege to hear the word of God in our own language. We can read it every day. I ran a youth club with a guy called Alan. And tragically, one day his wife just ran off with someone else. And he told me he was devastated. And he went to look for his Bible. And he looked beside his bed, it wasn't there. He looked downstairs in the sitting room, it wasn't there. And he thought, where can my Bible be? And then he suddenly thought, he went into his car, opened the glove cupboard, and there was his Bible. He only ever used it when he went to church on a Sunday. But on that day, he just happened, I'd given him a Bible reading plan, and it was Romans 5 that day, about how our sufferings produce perseverance. And God shook him that day, and he became a very godly man and a great preacher, but it was a terrible journey for him. But he just realized he was just ignoring the Bible, just leaving it from Sunday to Sunday. It wasn't being touched at all. We mustn't forget the privilege we have of hearing the gospel. And yet, hearing isn't really enough. John Wesley said that he grew up and he had the gospel in his head, but not in his heart. But anyhow, Peter, the first thing is he hears the gospel. He hears the word of God. The second thing in verses 2 and 3 is that we go on not just to hear the word of God, but to help with the work of God. Look at verses 2 and 3. Uh, Jesus, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down in the boat and taught the people. He asked Simon Peter now to help with the work. Okay, it was a little bit inconvenient. He had to stop mending his nets and he had to get into the boat and he had to row it out a little bit and then he had to keep the oars there to stop the boat uh, drifting with the tide or spinning around or whatever. So it was a little bit inconvenient, but it was a privilege. He must have thought, you know, I never ever expected that my boat would be used by Jesus to preach from. That's a real privilege. It's a bit like you when you bring someone to church in your car. You didn't realize that this car could be used of bringing someone, not simply to church, but to know Christ. When you use your home for a church barbecue or something, what a privilege. Oh yeah, there's a bit of inconvenience. But now you are being enabled to help with the work of God. You're not just hearing it with your head but now you're able to help a little bit. 
Now it's not just take, 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 but now you're able to give a little bit. You've meet, moved from being a drain to being a radiator. It's moved from just your mind now to your will, and you help with the work of God. Third step, verses 4 to 10, this is a big passage, is the third thing is to humble yourselves under the rule of God. So we've been hearing the word of God, and then we start doing things to uh, serve Christ. We help with the work of God. But here in verses 4 to 10, we find the next step is to humble ourselves under the powerful rule of God. The dynamics are changing. You see, it started off, Peter was just listening. No cost involved at all. Then Jesus asked him to help. And now Jesus is telling him what to do. Look at verses 4 to 10. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. You see, first of all, it was Peter's mind as he listened. Then it was Peter's will as he did something. And now it's his heart as he falls at the feet of Jesus Christ. But you see, Jesus said to Peter... There you can see it in verse 4. He said, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And you can imagine Peter, can't you, saying, well, you know, okay, it was a bit of a liberty for you to ask me to use my boat, but now you're telling me how to fish, and you're a carpenter. I'm the fisherman. I know all about fishing, and I know that you've got it all wrong. You never go fishing mid-morning. The fish, they go hiding down away from the bright sunlight at the bottom of the uh, sea. You'll never catch fish in mid-morning. And I've been fishing all night, and I've just done cleaning my nets, and now you want me to throw them all in the sea again. I'm just too tired. And this is just so silly. You do your carpentry and your preaching, and leave me to do the fishing part. That's probably how he was feeling. Yet in verse 5, he says, but. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. That's obedience, isn't it? He's not just listening and enjoying the ministry. Oh, that was nice. Had some funny stories in it. Enjoyed it tonight. Not just, you know, helping out. Yeah, I'll serve on the teas and coffees and yeah, I'll do some cleaning. But now it's taken to another level, isn't it? Now it's a total obedience to Jesus Christ. He realizes that Jesus is glorious. And as he obeys Jesus, There are sensational results. The nets are suddenly filled. It's as if all the fish in the Sea of Galilee make a beeline for Simon Peter's nets. What they would do, if I understand it correctly, is they would have a long uh, net and they would uh, dip it in the water and then they would row all the way around in a circle and hold the net and then pull a cord that would catch the bottom 
and then they would lift it out so all the fish would now be caught up. And there were so many that the nets were breaking, and he'd only just mended them. And they got the fish in the boat, and the boat was now filling up, so they had to call their friends in the other boat. Now, these boats weren't little rowing boats. If you go to Capernaum in Israel today, you can see the Jesus Boat Museum, because Back in 1968, there was such a drought in Galilee that they found actually the ruins of a first century uh, fishing boat, just like this one that Peter would have. And it was 27 feet long and nine feet wide. And it had a little stove in it so they could cook some of the fish while they were working all night long. They were big boats. And it was filled. And so they called their friends in the other boat. And their boat was filled. And now there were so many fish that the boats were sinking. It was sensational. When we take God seriously, and God doesn't become a hobby, and Christianity isn't a game, and church isn't a club, but Jesus is Lord, when we take things seriously, then our lives are in the right place with the eternal God. And his work is now being accomplished in us. Remember, as in my early 20s, the church I was at had a prayer meeting on a Monday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. I don't know the wisdom of having a prayer meeting at 6 o'clock in the morning, but they had a prayer meeting at 6 o'clock in the morning. It was one of the times when people could get there before work. And I remember once I had a week's holiday. And for some reason, I got up half past five on the first day of my holiday and went to that prayer meeting. Now, I'd been to that prayer meeting 20, 30 times. But that morning, an unforgettable experience. Such was the sense of the presence of God in that prayer meeting. That one after another, after another, after another, we're just praying about the glory of God's presence that was with us. And I almost missed it. I almost missed it. And I thank God I didn't. Those of you who are preachers will know that sometimes you're given a message to preach. And you don't want to preach it because you feel it's too offensive, too straight. But in obedience, you go and preach it. And you're just conscious of the smile of God resting upon it. And lives being touched. Because we're not doing our own thing. Now we're doing his thing. We're obeying him. And our lives are in the right place. Well, Peter realizes that Jesus is the expert, not Peter. Jesus is not only the expert at carpentry, he's not only the expert at preaching, he's the expert at fishing. He's the expert, not Peter. And Peter realizes that Jesus is the master to be obeyed. He is the Lord. And suddenly Peter becomes conscious of how sinful he is. That he is not fit to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And so he says, go away from me. I'm not fit to be in your presence. And then in verse 11, <laughs> we find he left everything to follow Jesus. <laughs> so he says, he said, keep away from me, but I'm not going to keep away from you. Have you ever had that experience where you're such a sense of the awesomeness of God that you feel? And frightened in his presence. And yet there's nowhere else, nowhere else I want to be. Caroline, my wife, her dad was a Yorkshire miner, rough, tough, godless guy. And because of a funeral, they started going to the church. Uh, and he would go to church and he would get under real sense of conviction of sin. So when the last hymn was being sung, he would run out. And um, so he didn't have to shake the minister by the hand on the door. So the minister would <laughs> run down <laughs> and try to catch him. And uh, Caroline's dad would be in tears because of the conviction. And he couldn't see clearly to shake the minister's hand. So he would grab him by the elbow or whatever. And he would go home. He said, I'm never going back there again. 
I'm never going back there again. Next Sunday, he was the first one ready. <laughs> and you, there, there's that sense that God is so glorious. Jesus is so great. I don't, I, I, I don't deserve to be in his presence. There's nowhere else I need to be. And then finally, I've gone on too long, sorry. Verses 10 and 11. We follow Christ with the whole of our lives. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore. Left. What's the next word? Everything. Two massive boatloads of fish. And they left everything. Peter's dreams had just come true. He had just won the lottery on the Sea of Galilee. He could now afford to buy a new house. He could now afford to buy some new clothes for his wife. He could now afford to retire. Look at all the fish he's got. But what's fish when you're in the presence of the Lord Jesus? What's money when you're in the presence of God? Suddenly his life had changed. He had spent all night trying to catch fish. And now he left all the fish to follow Jesus. Because he realized who Jesus was. It wasn't just in his mind. It wasn't just in his will. It wasn't just in his emotions. It was his whole life now committed to Jesus Christ. His old, his old dreams seemed to be so hollow. But now. He was going to invest his life in catching men for Jesus Christ. So on the day of Pentecost, he preached and thousands were converted. And then he went through Asia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, preaching the gospel. Michelangelo was walking down the streets of Florence in 1495 when a friend of his who was a, um, also an artist worked in chiseling away stone, was taking a great big block of stone or marble, and um, Michelangelo said to him, what are you doing with that block of marble? And he said, I'm taking it back to the tip. I can't do anything with it. And Michelangelo said, stop. Give it to me. There's an angel in there. And he took it home. He started to chisel away at it, and he produced his famous statue of the angel. As Jesus Christ looks at you, he sees, I know why I made you. There's a reason I made you just as you are. So as you hear the words of Christ, and as you get involved in the work of Christ, and as you humble yourself before the sovereignty of Christ, and as you follow Jesus Christ with the whole of your life, then you begin to live not to the level of your incompetence, not to the level of your competence, but to the level of God at work in you and through you. That same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is mightily at work in us who believe. So that's where I finish tonight. Where are you on those stages? You hear the word of God? You go away and forget it? You get involved in the work of God? Have you seen something of the glory of Christ and humbled yourself before him? You being obedient to him? Is your life totally committed to follow Jesus, every day, wherever he leads, we will follow him. Let me pray. Our God and our Father, we remember that old hymn, Make me a captive Lord, and then I shall be free. And so often we feel that our lives are a bit like a... Um, train that's just off the tracks and it's not running smoothly and we need to be 
in line with you, in tune with you. We need to be humble before you. We need to recognize that you are the Lord. And there, when you died upon the cross of Calvary, it wasn't a mistake. It was because you, the Lord of life, were defeating sin, Satan, death, and hell, that we might have life. And so here and now, we want to commit ourselves, not just to hear your word, but to live for you. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amen. It's very rude of me, but I'm not going to stay for communion. I'm going to nip home. I do apologize, but it's been lovely being with you. I have a little bit of a cold. I'm giving germs away. I had communion last Sunday night, communion this morning. So if you'll excuse me, I'll love you and leave you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much.